Hey everyone, it's Chris Keys for Premier Guitar. Today we're looking at the top 10 rig rundowns of 2022. How do we get this list? It is really simple. We logged into YouTube, sorted by views, and this is what we got. As we go from 10 to 1, John Bollinger and I will be providing some commentary about our experiences on the shoot and what it was like to hang out with these awesome, awesome artists. Before we go any further, myself, John, and Team PG would really appreciate it if you could hit the subscribe button and the bell icon so you don't miss anything that we're doing in 2023, including rig rundowns, first looks, factory tours, and everything else we got planned. We really appreciate it. And without any further ado, here are your favorite rig rundowns for 2022. Number 10, Corey Wong. Not only is a great player with a really unique style and a cool thing, but his signature Strat had a different body size than any normal one. That was very cool. I love it when rig rundowns can surprise you and you learn something. So if you took kind of your average Strat, because every Stratocaster is a little bit different, this one, the body size is maybe a couple percent smaller than the average Stratocaster. Oh, wow. And the headstock is a couple percent bigger. And the reasoning is, there's some, with the way that I play guitar being such a, a rhythmic driving sort of that right. sort of thing, the transient cuts, it, there's just a little sharper transient. It's just a little faster of a transient with the smaller body. And I thought I was nuts for asking for that. I thought I was nuts. Like all the smaller guitars like this that I played, I just feel that until I talked to Niall Rogers about it. And Niall is the same way. Niall said that this is exactly what he wanted. So I figured, okay, really? there's something to it. I'm so, not the only one who wants the kind of thinner, smaller body. I wonder if... Number nine, Anthrax. Perry Bean hosted this rig run down at the Ryman, which is an unusual backdrop for a metal show considering the venue's rich tradition in country music and its association with the Grand Ole Opry. Now I've seen plenty of shows that are considered heavy at the Ryman. I've seen the Deftones, I've seen Opeth, Macedon and even the Melvins. But when you stack a bill with Hatebreed, Black Label Society, and Anthrax, you're really testing the limits of the stained glass windows and the pews inside the Ryman Auditorium. Both Perry and I were stoked and a bit nervous to meet Scott Ian, but the dude couldn't have been any cooler, more approachable, or considerate with his time. He talked about his gear at length and even hung out afterwards chatting about ACDC and asked us questions from our rig rundown with Angus's tech, Trace Foster. Obviously, you could tell who this is an homage to, my friend Rick Nielsen. Uh, I'm a huge fan of his and Cheap Trick and have been since I was a kid. And uh, always loved his Checkerboard Explorer, just one of my favorite guitars on the planet. I got, actually got to play it one time when I, I played off Wiedersehen with them at the Greek Theater. And he asked me to jam with them and he said, what guitar do you want to use? And I was like, duh. Yeah. <laughs> well, if I can't play the five neck, I'll, I'll, yeah, spin that I'll settle for the checkerboard. Um, What's his setup yeah. like? Was it, was it, you know, did it, anything strike you weird about his no, guitar? No, it felt great. Felt great. Yeah. yeah. And it sounded great too. Mm -hmm. it was just, you know, I think I was playing straight through a Marshall. It sounded awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this was my homage to that. And Frank Bello was as charming and congenial as the interview depicts. Trust me. He cracked jokes and even made a splash showing off some prototypes for his then forthcoming Charvel Pro Mod signature bass. I know a big part of Perry's anticipation of the Anthrax shoot was meeting John Donis, who joined Anthrax in 2013 as the band's lead shredder, but Perry had been following him since his days in Shadows Falls during the 90s. And finally, it's really worth noting how big of a help Armando and the rest of the Anthrax crew were on that shoot. They treated us like family from the moment we stepped inside the Ryman. They were busting each other's chops, they were busting our chops, hell, they were busting the band's chops. And that type of attitude and atmosphere allowed for us to have a great shoot. Considering the circumstances, trying to get three rigs in one shoot, with three bands sound checking at a venue that doesn't allow sound to be made until after four, that is a chemistry for chaos. And you know what? Hats off, kudos to them. They were awesome, and because of them, the video was great. Check it out. Number eight, Def Leppard. We did a rundown on these guys about eight years ago, and at the time, Vivian had, was battling cancer, and frankly, I was worried about him. So it was wonderful to see him packing a stadium, looking great and sounding great. That was a, a real up about the rundown. Secondly, Phil's guitar necks, to, I'd forgotten how ridiculously thick 
those necks are. So to see that, I really think that Phil might be superhuman. He's, uh, he doesn't age and his hands manage to work with a, with a, with a bat type neck that no mere mortal could handle. That neck yeah. looks like it was built on a dare. Like, like I, like I, like, I dare you to make the fattest, most unplayable neck well, possible. Well, it was. Yeah. It, oh, really? Uh, so, so I'm always, every year, I, I, I go, do you think you could make the neck just a little bit fat? You know, God. just every tour. And, Why? I, I just love the way it sustains and it, it doesn't move. And I, I'm really quite aggressive and it never goes out of tune. So I, I just like the, the chunkiness of it. And you know, the heavy strings, they're like 13 to 54, I'm, I think, these guys. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, I just, just love how it feels. Anyway, they, they Jackson, I, I have another one. My favorite guitar of all my guitars is, there's a red one of this. It's got its maple top, but it's stained red. Huh. And um, they done it, they said, oh, well, Check this out then. And so they made it and they, they actually did that. They said they've done it for a joke. And I was like, man, this sounds great. This Perfect. Is, this is absolutely so when we come Number seven, Marcus King. We did a rig rundown on him years ago, and at the time I'd never heard of him and and didn't really know what to expect. And I kind of missed it. You know, sometimes when you hear a great artist and you don't really recognize their greatness, that was the case in the first rig rundown. But then I later uh, discovered his music and listened to a bunch of it, watched a ton of his videos, and I'm a huge fan. So it was great to see him come back. Small venue first time, second time he's selling out the Ryman, and just plain great, beautiful human being, amazing guitar player, amazing singer. This is a 58 body, uh, replaced neck, and uh, replaced pickups, but she's sweet as apple pie, man, and uh, we just put this strap on it, and. This is, I, I love yeah. that strap. Who, who makes that? Uh, Luke McClure out of Dallas, Texas makes these straps. And we just got this strap yesterday. And they brought me this guitar yesterday. And uh, <laughs> I just can't put it down. So <laughs> I guess I'm going to take it to Atlanta with me. Fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's great. I've been Number six, Smashing Pumpkins. Uh, I love seeing Billy's new signature guitars, both his acoustic and his electric uh, signatures. Very cool guitars. Secondly, to see Jeff's rig was great. It's a, it's, a, it's a cool combination of new technology and old school, and he's a total shredder. You know, you can color code all these buttons, so it, it, they, I made the, the, but, the, the channels match the buttons. So channel one is blue, we got green, purple, and red. Oh, but which and is it great. corresponds with the red yeah, logo, yeah. Which is great, so no when I'm on, way. actually, so when I'm on stage and say we play something like a new song, we're playing Empires, when I go into my rhythm sound, I know it's, I'm on oh. the purple channel. My lead sound is going to the red and yeah. It's a cool well, way to color code. Make so it I, like cause I can't really see the right. red from stage, but I, I can tell. Sure. Um, so I just, I, I just nod and agree. <laughs> so <laughs> if I'm right having, channel. if I'm getting lost or confused on stage and I'm like, oh, I want the red channel. I can see beforehand oh. what it's going to be. Yeah. That is really a clever <laughs> idea. Yeah. 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 Keeping it, keeping it simple yeah. it makes it, it makes everything a little easier. Well, know? this isn't exactly simple. Well, color coding. <laughs> yeah. color, color coding makes There's it simple. There's a lot going on. <laughs> simple for you, baby. Yeah. Number five, Guthrie Govan of the Aristocrats. I don't know what enchanted me more about that shoot. Guthrie's vast vocabulary on the guitar or his depth and use of the English language. Being around someone so talented can be intimidating and intoxicating. Losing yourself as they fluidly speak, or more specifically in Guthrie's case, run up and down the fretboard. One thing many fans may find surprising, and possibly endearing, is that Guthrie is uncomfortable in front of the camera. Me too, dude! You'd think someone who could play guitar with their feet better than I can walk would find such obligatory chores as boring, but his nervousness made the interview disarming. It gave his alien aptitude a familiarity and connection that put me more at ease. The resulting conversation you saw was equally entertaining and educational on his playing style and what he chooses to bring out with him on the road. And I could see else? the creativity just blooming in your eyes with this machine at your foot, yeah, at your it's, feet. I mean, it's good to shake things up a bit sometimes. <laughs> isn't it? I'm trying to think what else I've got that you might enjoy on here. Um, oh, maybe this. Um, this is something I always wanted on the pedal board but could never justify it. Um,
that kind of Frank Zappa diner flange kind of thing. And yeah. there's a way to do that by getting the the level of the note you're playing to control the time of a short delay. And there it is so inside here. The harder you hit it, the more out of tune it goes. <laughs> Oh, and I've got this other thing. Trust me, there's a point in the song where it actually needs that. It's the world's longest delay. Um. Number four, Megadeth. Since the Rig Rundown's debut in 2008, at any point during those last 14 years, I've done all the roles that are required to pull off a Rig Rundown. I've been lucky enough to meet icons like Brian May and interview some of my favorite guitarists that I've admired and whose music routinely shows up in my most played yearly roundups. But the most nervous I can remember being entering a shoot was the Rig Rundown I hosted with Megadeth's Dave Mustaine this May. That was intense. I love metal. And so his importance to the genre was one heavy nerve wracking factor, but the other was the persona that I often picked up from videos, interviews, things that he would do on camera, even dating back to behind the music that would terrify me knowing that I was going up against the Dave Mustaine. I equated it to Mean Gene interviewing Jake the Snake Roberts or Harry Potter interacting with Professor Snape. You just didn't know when the viper was going to strike. Turns out, at least for the 30 to 45 minutes we spent around Mr. Mustaine, it was memorable for all the right reasons. He thanked me and Perry for showing up. He answered all of our questions, even some that I don't think Gibson was wanting him to answer about some custom shop flying Vs that weren't out at the time, but now are out. And on top of all that, he kindly conversed with a young fan who wandered near his guitar boat shortly after rapping with us. And similarly to Anthrax and Armando, Dave Mustaine's tech, Brian Jones, was a big help before and after the interview. And with his help, he made the shoot an absolute dream. Number three, Mammoth WVH, or Mammoth Wolf Van Halen. This is one of the few times that Team PG had to venture outside Music City, and we took a field trip down I-24 south to Chattanooga, Tennessee. The Mammoth WVH team was unbelievably flexible and even requested that longtime EVH designer and personal builder to Eddie, Chip Ellis, attend the shoot so we could talk to him and Wolf about the SA-126. Now Chip, how did you take what he is associated with Mammoth and the sound that's been created in that first album, the 335 that we mm. spoke about, and create it into you know, a silhouette that's still familiar with the brand and kind of what you know, the EVH brand has been bringing to the people for, for years now? Well, it started with some sketches, some renderings. Uh, God, we've been at this one for, what, about a year now? Yeah. It developed a long <laughs> time. And it was so frustrating. So many people were like, you, you need to play something in the brand. It's like, dude, yeah, I'm yeah. working on it. We're working on <laughs> it. Like, can't talk let about me. it yet, you know? <laughs> no, but there was a lot of back and forth, a, a lot of tweaks. I mean, how many times did the headstock shape change? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, it's... Uh, it, Right it's before they went out on this testing. leg of the tour, I was up at 5150, shaving the necks a little bit thinner and, you know, getting them all, because I think we started out with three different neck shapes. Mm -hmm. just and then we kind of landed on basically mm -hmm. like the thinnest we could, that yep. the neck would let us and go. the others had to match it, so, <laughs> so we did that recently, and it, it's, it's a work in progress. And uh, like I was saying with Ronnie, this is just kind of what we've always done with EVH, is we come up with something, we tweak it, we tweak it, and see if it survives. Again, feeling like I was in deep waters treading around sharks, I was buoyed by the casualness of Chip and Wolf. It didn't hurt that Chip was wearing a Kaya shirt, so we hit it off talking about stoner rock and metal before Perry even started filming. Both men spoke openly and honestly about the difficulties building a new semi-hollow under the EVH banner that would both respect its traditions but push the brand forward. One part that I chuckled during and at any time rewatching is when Wolf apologized for a setup being too simple. Wolf, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. We're going to talk no to our Sorry, bandmates. I'm, I'm so boring. <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> straightforward. Are you kidding me, man? But that's what makes the Rundown series so exciting and continually re-energizing. Setups come in all shapes and sizes and can be just as inspiring and remarkable, no matter their footprint or cost. John Jordan had two things that stood out to me that made us fast friends. First of all, he's a huge metalhead, so we had a lot of musical preferences that overlapped. Awesome. Second of all, the dude is a dog dude. 
I myself am a dog dude. Here I am wearing a shirt of my dog that passed away last year, Doozy. And also, my current dog, <laughs> Fancy. <laughs> John equally loves dogs. He has his own at home in Texas. But what he does on Instagram is called Tour Pups, where he takes photos of dogs that he encounters, four-legged friends he makes while he's on the road with Mammoth and other bands, and posts about them and uh, just kind of shines a light and lets the dogs live in their best life. Frank turned out to be a puck man, so we hashed out what it's like to support a popular hockey franchise in warm weathered cities. He follows the Las Vegas Golden Knights, and I obviously spend time in Smashville with the Predators. And one day, maybe we'll invite each other into enemy territory. And Ronnie Flortis, when he said he's a legit fan of the Rig Rundown and never misses an episode, he even pulled out his phone and showed us screenshots of his favorite base rigs. In the Mammoth Rundown, I had called him out and he shared that he has one of his Fender Super Basement heads dialed to Mike Durnt settings as seen in the 2013 Green Day episode. Now I'm going to put you on the spot again, Ronnie. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You had mentioned that you play these Super Basements or you might have other ones that you use, but there's a Rig Rundown you've watched that you pull some settings <laughs> from because we got to okay, shut off for right. our own thing. We got to yes, pat our own yes. back sometimes. Um, I, I've been a fan of you guys. I've watched, <laughs> I've watched many of Rig Rundown. My favorite was, of course, uh, the Green Day Rig Rundown where uh, my buddy Mike Dern also plays the same amp, so he helped design this amp. Yeah. And uh, I did screen cap the shot that you guys did of it so I could try and snag his settings. And as you can see, um, if you do take a pic, uh, the channel one is the same settings from you. <laughs> That's lovely. Yeah. I love when that happens. It's, yeah. it's great. Number two, Joe Bonamassa. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan. Uh, I love his playing. I love his singing. I love his music. I love his gear, and he's just a really good dude. And to stand in the Ryman in front of that rig and hear him play, oh my God, it is like, it sounds like an angry God playing. <laughs> it is just an indescribable, amazing thrill to hear that. I'm sure you can hear it from outer space. And number one, Chris Shifflett. I don't even know where to begin with this one. A lot of high caliber artists we feature in the Rig Rundown require a lot of gatekeepers, buffers, additional layers of security, and it's all understood in our end. I can only imagine the invites and the things that get thrown their way, and so they have to have a lot of vetting, and I get that. We get that as a business, and I understand that. I'd probably want that for myself. So with that information, you might expect it to be a bit of a gauntlet to get Chris Shiflett and the Foo Fighters involved in a Rig Rundown. It wasn't. It was a breeze. It was a glide. However, it is worth noting that this rig rundown was easily the earliest one we've ever filmed. It was about 10 a.m., so we showed up to the Foo Fighters HQ, coffee in hand, and ready to go. Chris was chipper, cool, and calm. No pretense, no ego, it was no problem, man. What everyone quickly acknowledged in the comments section as Chris being a homie was exactly how Perry and I felt within the first 30 seconds of being around him. He provided personalized backstories to much of his setup, including two guitars that were bought by Dave Grohl when he first joined the Foo Fighters. It was a true joy and unbelievable opportunity to be around such a humble rock star. Now this one, when I was talking about uh, Dave buying me guitars, this was the other guitar. This was actually the first guitar we bought that day. Um, and we bought this at Voltage up on uh, just off of Sunset. And I don't know if you ever went into Voltage, but like I've been going in there since I was a teenager mm -hmm. and always, you know, like when you're a kid and you're going into guitar stores, no one's nice to you. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? They're like, don't touch that. Get out yeah. of here. So I've been having that experience and I never bought a guitar in there. They're all, you know, there's always all these beautiful vintage guitars. Yeah. And so to go in there with, uh, with Dave Grohl and his Amex was like one of, honestly, like I, it was like, that was a real moment for me. Like, yeah. <laughs> Put that on the credit card, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll take it. Um, I'll even play it. Yeah, and I actually picked this up because I knew that Dave played Explorers back then, you know, in the early days of the Foo Fighters. Mm. And I picked this up kind of as a joke, and I said, oh, should I get this? And he's like, yeah, totally. I was like, what, really? Oh. And so I did. And that's it, folks. For John Bollinger, I'm Chris Keyes. We both want to say thank you for tuning in to our reflections of the most popular rig rundowns of 2022. Before you sign off and move on to another video, please hit subscribe, hit that bell icon, that way we can get into your algorithm for 2023 and beyond. Thank you guys so much.